Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Hello, my homekins. This month seems to be all about interviews with nonprofit organizations, POC advocates, and families in search of their lost loved ones. I am honored to speak with Haley Omiso, the director of Okomi Forensics, a native owned forensic nonprofit organization that supports families of missing and murdered Indigenous people, which is MMIP. Haley is a forensic anthropologist who specializes in assisting the families of missing and murdered Indigenous individuals. She was motivated to pursue this career path due to her personal experience and the lack of resources available for the Indigenous communities. Haley's work involves identifying human remains, providing closure for families, and advocating for the justice and awareness surrounding these cases. Her dedication to helping those affected by these tragedies highlights the importance of representation and support for marginalized communities in the field of forensics. Let's dive right in, shall we? We've got a lot to cover. So my name is Haley Omiso. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Montana in the Forensic and Molecular Anthropology program. I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana, and I'm also an enrolled member of the Hopi tribe. And most recently, I became the founder and executive director of Okami Forensics. So it is a non profit organization under 501c3 that works to provide forensic services to the Indigenous communities based in Montana. Thank you for being here, Haley. Thank you so much for that. I'm so excited to know more about your organization and to talk specifically dealing with missing and murdered Indigenous persons, crisis that is literally U.S., Canada, something that's not being talked about. And I like to bring a dire need of awareness for this. And I'm glad that I get to speak with you specifically because you would be the go-to person to know in details. And that's the reason why, as your objective and how you established this company, what was your driving force in regards to that? So can you tell me, or actually tell the listeners about your understanding of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous People, which is an acronym MMIP, if you're not familiar, the crisis and why it is important to address this issue. Yeah, so the MMIP epidemic uh, refers to our Indigenous relatives that have gone missing, still have not been found. There's little evidence that show you know, what may happen to them and their cases often get put on the back burner and oftentimes never solved. Or individuals that have been found that were murdered but have never received justice for their cases. And I wish I could say that this was an uncommon issue with these types of cases, but they have been happening for decades. And we don't know exactly if this is an epidemic or a pandemic because this issue doesn't just occur in the United States. You know, it's happening in other areas of the world, too. So in order to help these families finally receive justice and closure and kind of begin the healing process, um, I think that it's very important that we address this issue and that we address it now. Exactly. That's why I I love having you here. Another voice who speaks out specifically on something, like you mentioned, this is an epidemic pandemic situation. This is a crisis. Mm -hmm. This is something that has been going on for generations, not just for a couple of decades. I mean, historically for generations, Mm -hmm. but for documentation record purposes, because the majority of it has been erased, burned, discarded, destroyed. We don't know how far back and how many people. Yeah. This has affected families for generations. You know, I've mentioned about intergenerational trauma, and that hits across the board for all people of color, specifically for the disproportionate population that we, you know, the communities that 
I like to address and to bring them to, to the forefront because we it needs to be talked about. I I don't want to have this being dismissed in the public's eye any longer. The more we dismiss it, the more we turn this blind eye that it's not really a serious matter, but it is. It's all it's been and it needs to be addressed immediately. So having your Okumi forensics mission, how do you think that um your mission aligns with the needs of the indigenous communities in, uh, that are affected by the MMIP crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think by the establishment of Okami Forensics, you know, our organization was motivated by real life issues and cases involving those affected by the MMIP crisis. And so we work to be able to provide forensic services and more resources to Indigenous people so that we can hopefully begin to close more cases that have been considered cold cases with modern day technology. You know, can you explain the significance of using both modern forensic methods and traditional knowledge in solving cases and bringing closure to families? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think that's one thing that not a lot of researchers and people in the forensics field think about is that when you're working with Indigenous cases, something we have to keep in mind is cultural sensitivity and that there are traditional customs and beliefs that we should be aware of as forensic scientists and as people being involved in these cases. And so that's something that that Okumi will definitely be incorporating is that traditional knowledge and making sure that we're consulting and just aware of these customs and these beliefs when we're working with Indigenous people because we want to be really mindful of all of that. And we want, we don't want to cause any more harm, you know, than has been the harm that has been caused, you know, with these cases. I think that that's our top priority. One of the things that I learned, there's two times that the person that is missing or as well as the family that's been affected by the the missing Indigenous person, they are traumatized in two ways. Mm -hmm. Not being, you know, not giving the recognition in regards to them being missing and then being dismissed in in media or people of different communities Mm -hmm. not turning attention to the awareness that needs to be addressed on this missing person. Something that really hurts my heart because, you know, you never, rarely do you ever see uh, anything come across. And and a lot of the different states had to push for the feather alert. You know, we come to the point where we have to force people to see that there is an issue. So, like, how... How would you ensure that field services and evacuation conducted by Okomi forensics are culturally sensitive and respectful of the Indigenous traditions and beliefs? You kind of hit on that, but I'm not sure if you wanted to elaborate in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So during the consultation process and, you know, prior to providing the actual forensic services, I think it's important to consult with the family and tribal representatives involved to ensure that we're being respectful of traditions and beliefs uh, while searching on and excavating Indigenous land and handling of human remains. So every tribe is different and has their own traditional customs. uh, So it's important that we're aware of those to ensure what we are doing is okay. However, some forensic techniques, such as the use of DNA, are not in favor of the Indigenous group that we're working with. So just making sure that we're communicating and consulting with them every step of the way to make things work so that we can bring their family member home and assist in finding out what happened to them, like I said, is at our top priority. Do you partner with other labs for DNA testing? Because I know this is a very particular like you mentioned, it's it's very minute in how you're supposed to collect DNA because it's coming from a such a small group and sometimes it's not even available to the system. So, you know, the Indigenous community has been dismissed on t- loads and loads of levels, which mm-hmm. which infuriates me on how you how the communities have been treated from the beginning. And it, it, it like I said, it infuriates me that 
these outside persons are doing these things to mm-hmm. the indigenous culture and, you know, taking away from the, taking their culture away from, taking their dance from them, taking their whole identity from them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that being stated with, like with other labs for DNA t- testing, how would you ensure the accuracy and reliability of the mm-hmm. DNA testing results when mm-hmm. it comes to dealing with partners? Yeah. So as of right now, we're still in the very early stages of getting our nonprofit up and running. We do hope to have our own lab uh, operating within the next few years or so. But until we can do that, we'll be partnering with DNA labs, such as University of Montana's uh, Snow Lab, which is actually the lab that I work in as a graduate student at the University of Montana. So basically, I would ensure the accuracy and reliability of the DNA by either just doing it myself or being overseen by my advisor who specializes in degraded bone DNA. And, you know, she's helped to identify individuals successfully in the past, as well as like assisting others in doing the DNA work too. So should we need to partner with, you know, another lab for evidence collection, for example, um, I guess I would just make sure that I'm aware of choosing a trustworthy company or individuals that have done similar work until we can, you know, like I said, get our own lab established and bring in our own professional DNA analysts. With that being said, for my PhD project specifically, I will be doing or using DNA analysis to help identify individuals that are known historic historical cases. And so these individuals are unidentified in these collections within like teaching institutions and museums and, you know, other collections. And in the way that we can do that because of how DNA has been exploited and how our tribal members have been, you know, just kind of mistreated in the past when it comes to DNA I'll start by just creating my own DNA database that will be tribally owned and controlled for my tribe specifically to kind of try to build that trust back and just starting there. I was just hoping that there is someone who, I can't say it's a new thing, but it's something that's, it's a pre- something that's happening it, as we're talking, it's moving forward, it's progressing, and you're helping it progress. And you're hope and I'm hoping that you find those that you can trust within this because this is a very sensitive, extremely sensitive thing because and it's personal mm-hmm. for you as well as the community that you you work to find, you know, the names of the of the persons that are I, I think that was even asking, like, if there was a Jane and John Doe, what would be an, another way to identify? Um, I think it was like white buffalo woman, or yeah. um, mm-hmm. in different in different indigenous communities, they you you know you, you use different pseudonyms in regards yeah. to the Jane and John Doe. Mm-hmm. That would be awesome to find out if that's something you would do. Because I'm just so excited about this this journey that you're taking on, and it's mm-hmm. it's not it's not a small feat on top of that. So oh yeah, and it definitely is like a lot of moving parts, and just like all these things you have to keep in mind, you know, when trying to do this work. It's and then you know being one of the first ones to really take take this on has definitely been a lot, and yeah, just trying to navigate all of that has <laughs> has been a wild ride, but you yes. know. Hope it's, do some good so, work. it's so worth it. It's so mm-hmm. worth it. And I am honored. Uh, I'm so happy for you. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't even it's like I don't even know like know you, know you, but I I I know your heart. Yeah. I think that's enough for me to jump mm-hmm. with like eagerness and joy yeah. because you're doing something that has been like finally, finally, yes. Yeah, I know. Oh, <laughs> so exciting. We want to bring them all home and have their names oh. and, and have them properly respected in their culture mm-hmm. and their communities. That is mm-hmm. so awesome. The outcome is just, that's that's the driving force right there. Yeah. Um, and I think it's important to like really get it out there and, you know, like coming on podcasts and talking about it because I definitely think that we need more Indigenous, you know, representation, you know, in these fields. And, you know, we just... Now, I'm going to keep 
building that momentum. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So how would you build trust in bridges between Indigenous communities and the criminal justice system? Oh, that's another scenario. As a representative of Okomi Forensics, can you please let us know what that is? Yeah, so I think by being a forensic scientist and then also an Indigenous person that has grown up here most of my life and understands how things work here, I try to be a leader and someone people can trust and go to when they feel like their family member's case is not being handled in the way that they feel it should be. So just being someone that will listen to the people and their needs and using my network of connections with professionals in the forensics field, law enforcement, and the criminal justice system uh, to relay those messages so we can all try and get on the same page to see how we can best assist the situation. I think the more people know, the more Mm -hmm. people are prepared, even though I had to think of that in in a scenario, but you would be the go-to or or the persons that you'd be working alongside with making it happen, getting mm-hmm. things done, making the process a success or at least closer than what it what has been for decades. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of Okami's role will just kind of be like reassessing some of these cases, especially, you know, these cases that are called cold cases and or can't be solved, you know, just reassessing them, looking back through all the lines of evidence and just providing new ideas, bringing on more uh, professionals in different areas of expertise that can assist on on the case. And, you know, we're just kind of taking these on a case to case basis because they're all different and all have different needs. So I think that that's that's Okami's role in that. How do you stay informed about the latest developments and best practices in the field of forensic anthropology? Yeah, I think I just best stay informed right now by being a graduate student and really connecting with my colleagues and, you know, just doing research. So, like I said, I'm going for my PhD right now. And so I'm around a lot of other like really great professionals that are all doing different things and we're just all sharing ideas and you know just kind of trying to work together as well as trying to network like at conferences and stuff like that I think it has been the best way. Yeah thank you. Can you explain how Okami Forensics work contributes to empowering Indigenous communities affected by the MMIP crisis or like you mentioned pandemic or endemic? Yes. Yeah. I think with Okami Forensics being one of the first probably run forensic companies, it kind of shows, you know, the younger generation and shows other Indigenous people that, you know, we can be in these positions and we do belong here. We can take on this work for our people and, you know, just assessing the the situations that we're in as Indigenous people and what we can do to best solve these these issues. And so that's one thing that I would like Okami to show to the younger generations, you know, is that we, you are capable of doing this work. We got to start taking back our own data and our own research and everything like that. So I just really hope that by starting this organization that it sparks interest and that other people want to go into the forensics field or want to kind of be in these leadership positions and wanting to help their people. Yes. I was just thinking while you're talking, like if you have like future, futuristic planning, mm-hmm. a program that kind of like, you know, the K the K-12 program that correlates with local schools and how they can get extra credits for particular curriculum or classes that can like, to excel in the interest of getting into that type of field that you are. So it's like the next generation. Yeah, I know. And once we get our lab established, that's really what I'm hoping for too, is doing like summer lab camps or, you yes. know, like having internships or something available to students and, you know, so that they can get into the lab and start learning, you know, these different processes and learning, you know, everything that we do 
in the forensics field and kind of spark their interest to maybe start their own company someday. And I think that would be really awesome. That is, that'll be the day that would be such a beautiful day. And I think it would be even more beautiful the day that we no longer have to do yeah. this type of shouting to the, you know, shouting to the mics and, and rallying and walking mm-hmm. and marching and showing the dresses and showing the posters and showing the people that are from the indigenous community who are not being heard or not being seen. That'll be the most beautiful day. I hope I'm on this earth to see that last day where the last person, the indigenous community has finally found all of them. They claim them. They've given them a respect, the name, the recognition, and we don't have to have this conversation anymore. Yeah, you know? me too. I hope that I can see that day as well. I I want to be put out of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to be sitting by the, you know, s- the sun and lay in the fields. Yeah. Just, you know, be yeah. next to nature. Mother nature is calling me for a long time now, but I am out oh. here. You yeah. know, because I have, we still have more work to be done. We have more work to be done. So I think lastly here, if people, if the listeners are wanting to know more information about your organization, how, where can they find your information, any resources that you could provide that the listeners can connect with you social media or on your website what will be the best way that they can reach out and at least support or contribute to the cause. Yeah. So my marketing manager, she's been working tirelessly on our new website. So I would say definitely check that out at okamiforensics.com. You can go there to see what services we're providing, kind of our initiative towards the MMIP crisis, as well as donate if, if you're able to donate. And I love setting up meetings with other people people to talk about things, or if you want to consult on a case that I'm not aware of, you can go there to contact me and and set up a meeting too. So. Yeah, you should have said that because I will be contacting you. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Because I know yeah. that I've been, I'm needing to get more information on some of the cases that are out there that are still, you know, like you mentioned, that are cold cases. Some cold cases that only someone who comes from the indigenous community would know the name of that person or a, per, or a person who is a podcaster who they want to bring the awareness and they took the time to respect that person in their story. And that's sad because it needs to be heard everywhere until they are found, mm-hmm. until they are named, get their name back. So mm-hmm. one of the stories that I, and I know we can probably quickly hit on them, but I, but I know that you wanted to choose some stories to talk briefly about, specifically, excuse me, Ashley Heavy Runner, Lauren, as well as Arden Pepion and Jermaine Charlo. Mm-hmm. Did you want to specifically talk a, a little bit about their stories briefly? Yeah. So I guess the reason why I brought these cases to your attention is because these are three cases that I have helped with, and they are all out of Montana. And there are many, many more cases. But Ashley Loring Heavy Runner is one that I always bring up in every conference speech that I do or any interview because she was my classmate and my relative from the Blackfeet Reservation. And she's still missing. And she's been missing for over six years now. So I'm really hoping that, you know, with the start of Okami Forensics, um, she has been my biggest motivation to get this organization started. So I'm really hoping that I can give back to her by helping her family find her and, you know, bring closure to her family and healing. With Arden Pepian's case, we have also been helping. She was a three-year-old, also from the Blackfeet Reservation, that is still missing, And so I'm really hoping that, you know, we can assist in finding her and what happened to her because that one just that her case really hits home to having my own children and, you know, seeing her family having to go out and search by themselves for their little girl is just heartbreaking and it shouldn't have to fall onto the families. And with Jermaine Charlo's case, you know, she was around the same age that I am and she also has two little boys that don't know what happened to her. 
and she was missing out of the Missoula area where I am at now. So I'm hoping to assist more on her case as well and helping find her. Yeah, I've been I've been following two of the persons that you mentioned, Ashley and Jermaine. Now, mm-hmm. Arden is a completely new name that I didn't even hear. And that's that just tells you that, A, the information did not come across. And that's that's very heartbreaking, especially for a family who's looking for this three-year-old girl. But I will put in my due diligence and research and make sure I give them the respect uh, on this podcast. Even if it's an extension from our episode, I will probably have their stories individually episodes, just kind of like adding to our conversation. So yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I'm just so ecstatic about the mission that you have ahead of you. I am so, like, if I was a mother, I am so proud of you. I might be older than you, but I'm going to still say I'm proud of you. It doesn't even, I don't even know if I have to be a mother to be proud of you. But I am so proud that you're doing something like this. It's making a huge, it'll make a huge impression and success. I wish all of that. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Yes. A lot of fun. It won't be our last. Believe me, yeah. I need more of this. Well, have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you so you much. Too. If you enjoy our show, please rate us on Apple or Spotify. And be sure to come back and listen to us every other Thursday. Until then, this is Jasmine Castillo. We are Voiceless No More. Proud member of Darkcast Network, Uncovered.com, Transdo Task Force, Crime Survivors, for safety and justice, and partner with Search and Support San Antonio and Seasons of Justice.